Well, welcome everybody. I think we can go ahead and get started. I'm sure we'll have a few people coming in as we get started. I'm Dominic Tarpey. I'm a member of the Planning Committee and welcome to today's Intensive Services Grand Rounds as one of the Grand Round series in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at UCSF. Today's presentation is uh, uh, an overview of the assessment of transgender, gender non-conforming patients in mental health settings. So very happy to have with us and presenting to us, uh, Brian D'Antoni Lasovsky, who is a psychiatric nurse practitioner here at UCSF on the pediatric consultation and liaison service at uh, UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital. And um, Brian is also a, a health sciences assistant clinical professor at the UCSF School of Nursing. And that's where he got his training as a nurse practitioner. And he also is, uh, I happen to be a social worker. So I'm also pleased because uh, Brian also happens to be a social worker by training. He got his master's in social work at Hunter College and has uh, extensive experience in direct patient care with kids, uh, adults, and medical surgical settings, uh, mental health, uh, both as a social worker and then um, obviously as a nurse as well. And uh, what we'll do uh, as we do with other grand rounds through Zoom is uh, feel free as the hour progresses to put your questions into the chat and uh, Brian will have uh, points along the way to respond to questions and uh, either myself or Nicholas will moderate and we'll go from there. So with no further ado, I will turn this over to Brian. Great, thank you, Dominic. Um, thank you everyone for joining, very happy to be here. Um, given the time, let's get started. So this is your standard conflicts of interest. I have no financial interest in anything I discussed today and no affiliations. Um, learning objectives, understand basic concepts of gender affirming care, how it relates to mental health, describe reasons why gender affirming care is important in the mental health setting, identify ways to make clinical environment gender affirming, understand how to integrate gender affirming care into the mental health assessment and identify community resources for patients and clinical staff. I've really put together this slide deck today to really be used also as a resource. So. Um, we're happy to send this out to people that are interested afterwards. Um, you know, I'm going to start with foundational knowledge. I know all of us have differing experiencing working with transgender and non-binary individuals. Um, however, I want to make sure that um, I start just with the foundational knowledge. Some of this will be review for some people, and for some people it might be new information. Start with a quote, it is important to recognize the continuous evolution of language is to be expected with regard to working with transgender clients as there are many terms that are used within transgender communities. Um, I put this quote here because I'm gonna go into some definitions and definitions and words change and the definitions and words change for each individual. So just because this is the definition I have up on the screen, um, doesn't mean it means the same for every single person. So transgender, this is usually an umbrella term. Someone whose gender identity is different from the gender they were assigned at birth. Cisgender, they identify as the same sex that they were assigned at birth. Gender identity is how one person, an individual feels on the inside. It's not their outward expression, that's gender expression. Gender identity is how they, what gender they feel internalized, internally. Natal biological sex assigned gender based on the genitalia that we're born with. Sexual orientation, gender, genders to which the individual is sexually attracted. Um, I always like to point out that gender identity and sexual orientation are two separate aspects of someone's identity. And then you'll notice the asterisks is I want to make sure that people also walk away from this remembering that, you know, gender identity, um, sexual orientation is on a continuum and people can change their identity or feel a different identity or feel a or are attracted to different people at different times. Some more definitions, intersex, an umbrella term um, that connotates a wide 
a range of natural body differences. Um, so natural hormone concentrations or different external and internal biology um, or genitalia. Gender expansive, an individual who doesn't fit the cultural masculine man or feminine woman stereotypes. This often is much more referring to gender expression than gender identity. Um, and then we have gender non-binary, gender queer, gender fluid. Um, I kind of lumped these together. And again, these definitions for each one is different for each individual um, who identify as gender queer or gender fluid. But uh, ultimately, individuals whose gender identity doesn't fall into one of the two culturally binary categories of man or woman. Um, big takeaway here, there's no right or wrong way to be non-binary or transgender. I think within our culture, we get so caught up within the binary structure of gender that um, we each come at it with our own preconceived notions and our own biases, but really there's no right or wrong way. And we'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. Uh, binding, tucking, packing. Um, these are practices that allow transgender, gender non-binary individuals live their self-affirmed gender. Um, so there are risks associated with certain types of binding or tucking. Um, for example, using duct tape to bind. Binding is where you um, flatten the chest. Um, there are binders that people can buy. And tucking is when someone takes the penis and flattens the groined area by wrapping it under. Um, again, there are risks associated if people use duct tape. Um, there are a lot of resources online. I did include some resources about proper binding, tucking, um, in the resource section. I included this just because depending upon your scope of practice, it might be important to know this when talking with patients. Transition, we're going to talk a little bit more about transi transition more in depth, but in general, this is the, the, the steps a person takes to live their gender identity. And this, I really want to stress this, that this process is different for every individual. Not everyone goes through the same stepwise transition. Some people who feel transgender or non-binary don't take any steps in a transition, and I'll talk more. And passing, this is a transgender person's experience of being viewed as the gender they wish to be perceived as. This is important to some individuals and not important to other individuals. It's a per personal preference as to where they want to be as passing. So just some outdated charting practices and language. Um, a big caveat to this is I've had plenty of patients that have used different words on this list to describe themselves. And that's their choice and that's their you know, option to use those words to describe themselves. Usually I'll ask them if those are the words that they would like me to use within the clinical practice as well. Um, so words that really are outdated, sex change operation or sex reassignment surgery. We really use gender affirmation um, surgery now or gender affirmation hormones. Transgendered, um, this is in past tense. Um, transsexual, she male. In the chart, slashing she, him, him, her, son, daughter, to describe the patient's gender, um, it, you know, we should really be charting their preferred pronouns. Hermaphrodite, tranny, transvestite, cross-dresser, gender non-conforming, if you note, the original title of this was um, included gender non-conforming, and I really switched that to gender non-binary, because non-conforming really um, sticks with that binary concept that someone has to conform to a certain uh, gender within our society. And then using quotation marks around pronouns and names. Um, we just use pronouns and names. We don't use quotation marks around them. Myths and false beliefs, there are only two genders. Gender identity and or expression doesn't change. Again, it's on a continuum. Everyone should be classified as male or female. We have a very binary culture, as I had mentioned. 
Um, and there are people who do not identify as male or female. Transgender females are attracted to men, transgender males are attracted to women. This is a very heterosexist view of um, transgender sexual attraction. Transgender individuals are confused or going through a phase. You must have hormone treatment or surgery to be transgender. This is very important because, you know, a lot of patients choose not to go through hormone treatment or go through surgery. And that's their personal choice. Um, it could be due to finances, could be due to personal reasons. All transgender individuals want to be on hormones or have gender affirmation surgery. Nine binary is just a phase towards a binary identity. This is very similar to the, the you know, false belief that bisexuals are just you know, experimenting until they become gay or lesbian. Um, you know, binary is just as valid as transgender um, or male or female. One's gender role is the same in every area of their life. Um, we have to remember that just because the patient presents as one gender to us does not mean that's the gender they are comfortable or uncomfortable in in the rest of their life. You know, and that can be often for safety reasons. Um, or their own personal choice. So they might present to us as a transgender male, but when they are home with parents or family, they identify to their parents or family and present as a cis woman. Um, so it's really important to remember that just because they're presenting as one gender to us doesn't mean that's how they present in the rest of their um, life. As I mentioned, we were going to talk about transitions, um, social transition. This is really adopting gender affirming hairstyles or clothing, putting on makeup, jewelry, anything that affirms their gender identity in, through gender expression. And this social transition gives them a way to, you know, experience the world as their affirmed gender. Um, this can happen at any age and it is reversible. Puberty blockers. Um, in early adolescence, a lot of times for transgender youth, puberty blockers are used. This, uh, you know, is reversible once puberty blockers are stopped. Puberty will resume. Um, gender hormone, um, gender affirming hormone, we have testosterone or estrogen. Usually older adolescents and adults um, starts the process of gender affirming hormone therapy. Um, and this is, you know, there, there are partially reversible effects of harm, a gender affirming hormone therapy. And we're gonna talk about that when we talk more at the end. Gender affirming surgeries, again, older adults, um, older adolescents and adults, this is not reversible. So there's top surgery for the chest, bottom surgery on the genitals. There's um, feminization surgeries that can be done and then finally, legal transition. This is the changing of gender markers on um, legal documents, changing of name to the preferred name um, on birth certificates, school records, et cetera. And this can happen at any age and it is reversible. Um, there are places like Lambda Legal, which is a LGBT legal service and the Transgender Law Project here in the Bay Area that often provide pro bono um, name changing clinics. And those are um, more information about that is available in the resource section of this slide deck. So the 2015 US transgender sur survey was the largest survey, 27,715 participants of people 18 years and older. And I really wanna just talk about some of the mental health and overall disparities of the um, transgender and non-binary community. In this survey, they found that um, people who are, you know, perceived or out as transgender at school, 54 of them were verbally harassed, 24 physically attacked, 24% physically attacked, 8% um, were kicked out of the house because they were transgender. A third of the participants overall who saw a healthcare provider reported having at least one negative experience related to being transgender. One in 10 reported being physically attacked in the past year. 47 reported having sexually 
assaulted at some point in their, having been sexually assaulted at some point in their life. Um, so, and then four times more likely to live in poverty. So there, there are a lot of disparities that um, occur. Suicide and gender non-binary, suicide and transgender and gender non-binary individuals have a much higher risk of having suicidal ideation and past suicide attempts, especially trans youth. Um, you know, this one study at a LA gender clinic, 51% of the participants reported ever thinking about suicide and 30% had attempted. Another study compared um, the rates of transgender youth compared to their cisgendered peers and found that 56% of the transgender youth had suicidal ideation versus 20% of the cisgender comparison. Um, suicide attempts, 31% versus 11%. And then non-suicidal self-injury, so self-harm, 30% versus 8%. Um, in the transgender survey that we talked about, 40% of respondents stated they attempted suicide in their lifetime, which is approximately nine times the rate of the US population um, in 2016. Um, nine times the rate of those who um, were not part of the survey who stated they attempted suicide. 92% reported that their first suicide attempt was before the age of 25 and 34% reported their first suicide attempt was at the age of 13 or younger. So the big takeaway from this is that we really wanna make sure that when we're working with transgender, gender, non-binary individuals that we are assessing um, for any suicidal ideation, any non-suicidal self-injury. So the good news is um, that, you know, transgender youth who are supported by their parents or at school or in the community had similar rates of mental health comorbidities to cisgendered peers. Um, this is a great slide from um, Trans Pulse, which is great to hang up in clinics also. Why support for trans youth matter? The numbers in blue are trans youth who had parental supportive parents versus the yellow who, of trans youth who had unsupported, unsupportive parents. Um, you'll see that described mental health is very good or excellent, 70% in the blue, 15% in the yellow. Suicide attempt, 4% in the blue, 57%. So you can see, you know, the, the, how strongly, you know, positive mental health outcomes were with um, supportive parents. This is another really great um, poster for rooms. This is from the Family Acceptance Project, which is based out of San Francisco State University. And this is um, you know, a poster that's great for especially youth clinics, just about supporting um, ways that um, parents or caregivers can support their LGBTQ youth. Um, I wanna take a second, just check if there are any questions. I know that was a lot that I just went through, but just a real quick. I don't see any so far, Brian. Great. Okay. So this next section, um, there is no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. I really wanted to just spend a few minutes talking about just intersectionality and how important it is specifically in regards to transgender people of color. Um, this picture here is a picture of Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera, um, who are both um, LGBTQ, were both LGBTQ activists. Um, and the story goes that Marsha P. Johnson on the left, it was the first person that threw a brick at Stonewall. So, which really started the riots for leading towards much more LGBTQ rights. Um, so intersectional, intersectional theory really looks at the interconnectedness between um, systems of inequality. So people who are from oppressed gender identities or sexual orientations or races um, and really looking at the um, effects of those multiple oppressed identities on the overall health of the individual. Um, I like this quote 
This is from um, Healthcare Experiences of Transgender People of Color. Um, trans people of color do not face systems of oppression in isolation. Rather, they confront the intertwined dynamics of transphobia and racism together. An intersectional approach means examining how their experiences are impacted collectively by multiple social identities, i.e. race, gender, identity, and sexuality. This is from the same study, which was a qualitative study. Um, my provider would make assumptions about me just because of my race and my being transgender, like, oh, so are you a sex worker? Are you this? Or are you that? Um, in 2020, 44 transgender and gender non-binary individuals were murdered in the United States. 79% of those who were transgender non-binary were transgender non-binary people of color. Um, there's much more health disparities and mental health disparities for this population. Um, in this study that looked at respondents in the National Transgender Discrimination Survey, which was done in 2011, it was a broad survey and it had about 6,400 participants. And this sub-study looked just at the Black respondents. 21% reported being refused medical care due to bias. 34% reported postponing care due to fears of discrimination. 49% reported having a suicide attempt um, versus 41% of all respondents and 1.6% of the general US population. Um, and then the bottom there, 34% reported a household income of less than 10,000 a year. And that was compared to 15% of all the study respondents, 9% for the general black population in 2011 and 4% for the general US population in 2011. But some good news, just like we saw in earlier slides um, in the study, black transgender individuals who were out to their families had higher rates of acceptance than the overall sample of respondents in that study. Um, those that were accepted by their family were much less likely to report discrimination um, and then family acceptance, you know, correlated with lower rates of negative outcomes such as suicide, homelessness, and becoming HIV positive. Okay, we're going to move on to gender affirming care, but I do want to just check in again real quick, see if there were any questions. None in the chat so far. Okay, great. So gender affirming care is kind of an umbrella term and it can, and can include a bunch of different things. So it can include using the appropriate pronouns um, in language that's gender affirming, providing a clinical space that's welcoming and having staff in all areas that are trained in gender affirming care. Um, this is really important. You know, if we're going to be providing gender affirming care in our clinics, we need to you know, make sure everyone has the same training talk more about that in a little bit. And then gender affirming care also means, you know, medical procedures that align with one's gender identity. And this can, again, include surgery or hormone treatment. So we want to really, in general, try to use gender neutral language. And there's a little chart below there that gives just some examples, like instead of mom, dad, parent, instead of vagina, internal genitalia, penis, external. Um, what I always say with this is, you know, you can ask your patients um, what words they like to use for their genitalia, if it's clinically appropriate for what you're doing with them, if it's necessary. Um, mirror the language they're using. Um, if you don't know what a word means, ask, you know, it's all part of cultural humility is just asking what that means if you don't understand it. Um, ask what pronouns they use. Um, this is a cool little website for practicing pronouns. I know a lot of people can sometimes have difficulty with they or them pronouns that some prefer. Um, this website just has some fun little exercises to practice that. And then avoid dead names. And a dead name is the name that a patient was assigned that correlated with the gender they were assigned when they were born. 
um, we always want to use what their, um, a lot of times in our charts, it says their preferred name. Um, I don't like that word preferred, but that's my opinion. Um, so that's really the name you want to use in all situations and avoid their dead name. What if I use the pro wrong pronoun or name? You will. You know, we are human, we make mistakes, then we're going to use the wrong pronoun and or name, especially when we're looking through charts and their past pronouns or their, you know, dead name is listed in the chart. We sometimes use it by mistake and really just apologize, make amends, move on. Um, I'm sorry for using the wrong pronoun or name. I'll use, you know, he, she, or them, not a complete list of pronouns from now on. So intake, like I was talking about, the intake is the really sometimes the most important um, space for our patients because it's the first impression. It's the first impression of how they'll be accepted or not accepted, how safe they'll feel. Um, you know, all intake front desk staff, anyone who has contact with a patient should have training in gender affirming care. And Fenway Health, which is a LGBTQ clinic out of Boston, has an amazing amount of resources for trainings online. They're all free, they're all webinars. Um, and you know, I'll mention some others later in the presentation, but they really have some great trainings. Um, forms, you wanna make sure that you have areas to indicate their preferred name and legal name. I just say here, their name and legal name. Um, and then name and pronouns for different areas of interaction because we often, uh, one thing that we fall short of in our charting a lot of times is we can be really good at asking pronouns and you know their name, but we don't always, or sometimes I don't always remember, I'll speak for myself, um, that people live different gender identity, gender expressions in different areas of their life. Um, and that can be due to safety. They might, you know, at work identify as a cis male and at home a transgender woman. Um, so asking what they would like to be you know, how they would like to be referred to in different areas, so the waiting room or leaving a voicemail, et cetera. Um, what sex were you assigned at birth? Um, these are just two examples on the right of this slide. That should also um, include intersex on there. Um, I do not include that, but it should include intersex. And then what's your gender identity? And here's a whole list. It's always important to include that fill-in section because there, there are multiple gender identities that people identify as. Posters, flyers, stickers, buttons, um, gender neutral bathrooms are all you know, ways to physically make the environment much more gender affirming. There are a ton of posters like the gender unicorn, the gingerbread person, um, these are great posters just to, you know, talk a little bit more about the um, spectrum of gender and sexual identity. Um, and these are some other posters that, you know, you can get online. Um, a lot of them are free or just print them. Uh, I love this one. We are the blessed ones. This was a collaboration between a transgender poet and a transgender artist um, of color who put this together, it really symbolizes the, the opposite of the disparities that we're so used to hearing about of transgender people of color. And this is really to present the joy that they feel when they are gender affirmed. All right, any questions up until this point? Yeah, Hi, Brian, we have one question. Um, can you give more explanation why vagina and penis are considered quote unquote bad? Is that because they are gender based? I often don't understand this because they are medical terms. Um, it is because they're gender based. They, they are binary, you know, in the, I think we, 
we want to use wording that the patient prefers. And I wouldn't say in the chart, you know, in the chart, you would probably use vagina or penis um, to use these medical terms. Yes, they are medical. But when talking to a patient, it, you know, they might not identify or the talking about penis might be very, un a penis is, might be very uncomfortable for them. Um, and, or a vagina. And there, there are numerous words that individuals use. So this is really more in regards to when you're talking with the patient. Um, and again, you can say, you know, you, you're, you're mentioning, you know, if, if you're doing, I, I, I think most of us are mental health, but if you're a primary care physician, you might say something like you mentioned having, you know, a spot on your penis that you're concerned about. Is there a word that you'd rather I use than penis to describe your sexual organ? And giving them the option to provide a word um, that they might feel more comfortable with. But again, in the chart, use the medical language. Anything else before I move on? You know, I actually had a question and you may get to this, but just in terms of telehealth with its advantages and disadvantages that I think we're all uh, quite used to at this point, are there anything in particular for this uh, population to point out with using telehealth, which is especially in mental health is probably here to stay for a long time. Yeah, it can be, um, you know, I, I always ask my patients, do they feel like they're in a space where they feel like what we talk about will be confidential, um, or do they feel that they're, you know, that they're not in a space where they they can just be alone? Um, just because there there will be questions, you know, generally that I might not ask if a partner or parent or caregiver are there in the room. So really always asking about that and the confidentiality if they feel like they're in a space where they feel safe to talk openly. Someone wanted to see the gingerbread slide again, but uh, I think Brian mentioned this, we can uh, certainly share this slideshow with everyone or whoever's interested and email it to you after the fact. Here, it's right here. So this is the gender gender bred person in the gender unicorn. And some people sometimes use this to talk with patients or use it as a tool to really have the mark on the um, spectrum of where they feel with their gender identity um, on, you know, to the left is they don't, you know, they do not connect with that part of themselves at all and to the right, you know, so it would be like zero to 100%. And it breaks it down to gender identity, gender expression, anatomical gender, um, and then sex assigned at birth, which is just female, male, or intersex, who you're attracted to and who you're um, sexually attracted to versus romantically attracted to, because that can be different for different people as well. Okay. Um, next, I'm going to move on to assessment. So this is the criteria for gender dysphoria, and I'm not going to go through the criteria at all. Um, it's in the DSM-5. I'm just going to talk a little bit uh, briefly about its history, talk about, um, you know, the, some controversy around it, um, and talk about working with clients around this diagnosis. So brief history, in the 1920s, Magnus Hirschfeld in Germany was a sexologist, and he's the first person that documented the difference between same-sex attraction and transsexualism. Um, Magnus Hirschfeld himself was um, a uh, gay Jew who was kicked out of France by Nazi Germany. Um, and the, if you've watched the show Transparent, they had a whole intersectional season where they had this sub story about Magnus Hirschfeld. Um, so just a fun fact. 1949, David Caldwell, this was the first conceptual diagnosis of gender identity, which was called psychopathia transsexualis. Um, Dr. Harry Benjamin published the transsexual phenomena, which he was actually one of the first pioneers of hormone 
um, hormone replacement therapy. Uh, DSM-1 and DSM-2, there was nothing about gender identity in those two. In DSM-3, we had transsexualism. In four, transsexualism was replaced with gender identity disorder in adults and adolescents. And in 2013, the DSM became a little more woke and replaced gender identity disorder with gender dysphoria in adults. And it also created the separate category for gender dysphoria in children. Um, some information about prevalence. Um, you know, I, take these numbers with a grain of salt. It's probably a lot of underreporting. Um, the picture of the United States there are the are those identifying as transgender, not those diagnosed with gender dysphoria, but the DSM-5 prevalence data of natal males, so those who were assigned male at birth is 0.005 to 0.014, natal adult females 0.002 to 0.03. Again, probably a lot of underreporting. Um, so some comorbidities, there's, you know, there's some, how do I want to state this? Some um, rumors, myths that um, people who have gender dysphoria are more, more likely to have a personality disorder um, because there, there can be, those living in unsupportive environments can develop traits of personality disorders. Um, and really, you know, a lot of these traits of personality disorders usually resolve in a gender affirming environment or with gender affirming uh, treatment, um, whether that be therapy or hormone, gender affirming hormones or gender affirming surgery. Um, so that doesn't mean that someone who has gender dysphoria can't have a personality disorder. It just means that we really want to also take a trauma-informed approach and really think about the environment and what kind of environment they grew, in, grew up in and what trauma they experienced. There have been rare, but some cases where delusions or, and or psychosis led to intermittent thoughts about gender incongruity. There are a few case reports, um, but rare. And as we've already discussed about the mental health disparities, there's definitely higher rates of depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation, especially in gender non-affirming environments. So the, the transgender and non-binary community have a very long history of being pathologized by mental health and the mental and the medical community. And we, we really, as providers, need to remember that. Um, and we need to remember that gender variance is not pathological. You know, what, what the issue is with gender dysphoria, it's not that they identify as another gender, it's that they do not, they, there is a great discomfort, um, a, a lot of distress around the gender they were assigned versus their gender identity. And that distress and discomfort is what um, the gender dysphoria is about. It's not the, a disorder because of gender variance. As providers, we want to make sure that we openly discuss this diagnosis. Most insurance coverage, um, you know, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, really require a diagnosis of gender dysphoria. And with patients who I have worked with in the past, I, I always bring up this diagnosis and the fact, you know, they're often aware that they need to have this diagnosis in order to move forward with their treatment. Um, and we really talk about, you know, how they feel about that diagnosis, what it means to them, what it doesn't mean, really to process through that and identify and talk about um, just the collaboration around that diagnosis. You know, the ultimate goal would to meet, be to move transgender treatment much more to a medical diagnosis or a, endocrine diagnosis rather than have it in the mental health realm. And it's important to remember not all gen transgender people suffer from gender dysphoria. There's this 
concept in the transgender and non-binary community of gender euphoria, which really is the feeling one has when one presents as their gender identity and is seen and feel supported within their community. Um, so, you know, there, there's some great videos on YouTube of people talking about their experiences, feeling gender euphoria and feeling seen and heard. Um, so I kind of like that concept of gender euphoria. Um, before I move on to the next slide, just want to check in about questions. Yes, there's a question. What about DID patients who have alters of differing gender identities and expression? That... I'm not an ex expert in that area. Um, so I, I would really defer to those who are. Um, I, I guess I, I wanna know more about what, what, what is the question about those individuals. Um, I think that, I think that there's a lot there. Um, and again, I'm not an expert in that field. Um, so I, I'm going to say, I don't know, and have my own humility. And, um, you know, happy to, if you want to email me, my email will be at the end of this. Um, I can definitely look more into that and happy to send more information about that because I'm sure it's out there. Anything else? Uh, no, I think that's it. Okay. Oh, wait, wait, whoops, someone, oh. yeah, the, the, to clarify, trans people need to have a gender dysphoria diagnosis for their gender affirming medical procedures, not just for psych treatment, question mark. So they don't need it, they often, um, I'm, I'm gonna get to more of that. I'll, I'll answer that question in a little bit when I get to another slide, cause I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that. So, this is general assessment for individual, some tips for general assessment for individuals who are transgender and non binary. Um, you know, strong teaching point here focus on the presenting problem. If they're not coming in for gender concerns, um, then, you know, we don't want to stigmatize people by focusing on their transgender gender and non-binary identity if they're not coming in for any gender concerns. That being said, there's still questions we wanna ask about our patient just for that general assessment. Um, I often will use the phrase, I ask this of all my clients um, in an effort not to stigmatize when I'm asking some of these questions, um, such as history of trauma, hyperarousal, hypervigilant symptoms, again, much higher risk for a history of trauma, um, much higher risk for PTSD, um, bullying, physical or verbal, safety at home, how safe they feel, prior suicide attempts, non-suicidal self-injury, substance use, um, and then other questions to ask when it's appropriate and clinically relevant. How do you identify your gender identity? What pronouns do you use? How does your partner identify their gender? What terms do you use to refer to your genitals? This is going back to the earlier question. Um, you know, this if I need to do a physical assessment of some sort or ask questions about physical genitalia, then this is a question I will ask them. And then what types of sex are you having? Um, again, depending on your clinical role, some of these questions would not be appropriate. We also want to make sure that we assess for resilience, um, asking what their support system is like, what's their environment at school or work, um, do they have someone that they are out to at school or work, what's your home life like, do you have support in your community, any support groups or social groups that they belong to, um, and then when you're feeling distressed, what has helped you? Really to check in with their resilience. So, you know, assessment of gender concerns. If the patient is coming to you because 
they have concerns around their gender or their gender identity. Um, you know, we want to remind patients that exploration at all levels is normative. Um, you know, there's a lot more media out there and much more representation out there, um, which is more positive and uh, moving in the right direction. So people may feel more comfortable looking at it, but reminding them that it is normative to think about this and talk about it. Um, when you're assessing gender concerns, asking, you know, what age they are, were when they first became aware of feeling different, um, were there any ways that they expressed themselves as a kid um, around their gender identity? Um, not that toys need to be binary, but in our culture, they often are. Um, so ask, sometimes asking about toys that they had or wanted, um, any negative sense of self due to their gender non-congruity when they were a kid or an adolescent, um, any distress due to pubertal changes, um, whether that's puberty in the past or if they're going through puberty, asking about if it caused any distress for them, any history of discrimination or harassment, changes to gender expression, what felt good, what didn't feel good about it. Um, really exploring again that concept of gender euphoria and really trying to take a strengths-based approach about their, their process and their journey. And then any plans for social, legal, or medical transition. So, you know, again, not everyone transitions. Um, some people only socially transition. Some people only legally transition. Some people medically transition. Everyone's different and everyone's journey is different. But we do want to make sure that we, you know, um, ask about their plans to transition. And if they don't plan to transition, asking about, um, you know, is this your choice or is this, you know, are you not transitioning because of safety or what, what process went into your decision around your transition plan or your lack of transition plan? And then any history of gender affirming surgery or gender affirming hormones. This is also important depending on your clinical scope, um, asking about gender affirming hormones because you might wanna ask, you know, were they through a prescription or were you getting them through a friend? Um, if they were getting them through a friend, just asking about how they found out about proper dosing, what, um, you know, how were they getting their needles in a very non-judgmental way asking this. Um, so, you know, and asking, you know, do you have any history of sharing needles? Cause then you wanna go, down that route of assessing that if it's clinically appropriate to your practice. Um, I see that there might be a question. Yes, is substance use, particularly substance use disorders more common in transgender non-binary individuals than among other groups? Yes, the, the, the research shows, especially I can definitely speak to um, the numbers for trans youth. Um, the national data for trans youth um, is significantly higher than their cisgender peers. Um, th that's also the studies I've seen for adults. Um, it's also very similar. There's definitely a higher use of substances within the trans and non-binary community. Um, specifically, again, for those who grew up in um, or who are in non-affirming environments. Because we really want to look at this in a, a, from a trauma-informed lens. This is um, just some sample questions. Um, I'm you know, running low on time, so I'm not going to read through these. This comes from Transgender Mental Health by Eric Yarbo, which is a great book. It's in the resource section. Treatment, I put treatment in quotes here because we're not treating the gender identity, we're treating the patient. Um, I don't want people to walk away from this thinking we're treating the gender identity. Um, there are a bunch of different professional standards and competencies out there for this group. The ones to think about are the American Counseling Association and the American Psychological Association. Both have guidelines around counseling and practice guidelines for, for transgender and gender non-binary. For those in primary care who might be on here, Dr. Madeline 
Deutsch um, at the Transgender Care Center has great guidelines. Again, these are in the resource section. So there were questions about um, referrals and hormone and surgery. So requirements for gender affirming surgery or gender affirming hormones vary by state insurance carrier and healthcare facility. Mental health evaluation is often required before gender affirming surgery or gender affirming hormones um, with a letter of support by the mental health provider required. Um, that's not within the scope of this, um, this grand rounds today, um, but Fenway Health again has a great training. The link is in the resources of providing mental health assessment for gender affirming surgery referral letters. And it um, also in the resources is an example from the American Psychiatric Association of some sample letters for gender affirming surgery or gender affirming hormones. Some hormonal therapies, just to keep in mind, masculinizing, we have testosterone. There are three that are irreversible when a patient starts testosterone. Those are deeper voice, Adam's apple, and facial masculinization. Those are non-reversible after the person stops testosterone. And then you have feminizing, which is androgen or estrogen. Um, and you have four areas that are irreversible breast tissue, feminine fat distribution, discrete, decrease of spontaneous erections, and skin softening. These are all irreversible um, effects of the hormone therapies. Uh, so there's some worry out there in the community or some urban legends that gender affirming hormones um, can affect the mood, um, but that's actually not the case. Most individuals report an improvement of mood really because um, that should say transgender men. Um, so they report an improvement of mood, um, again, because this is much more gender affirming. Um, however, with testosterone at above average blood levels or above average dosing, um, there can be some more anxiety, mania, hypomania, or psychosis for those who already have underlying psychiatric disorders. Um, with androgen and estrogen, the more feminizing hormones, there can be subtle mood changes, but not um, nothing that would meet diagnostic criteria for a mental health disorder. Um, surgery, surprise, the research has shown a reduction in gender dysphoria symptoms, and the research out there is that, you know, there's rare surgical regret. Um, mental health treatment, we want to focus on the presenting problem. If they're not coming in for a gender concern, then it's not, you know, we don't need to focus on gender. Um, we do want to explore the sexual, psychosocial impact of treatment or transition. If the person's transitioning or talking about treatment, how, what's it going to be like for friends, for, not for friends, but what's it going to be like um, for them to be with friends or family or at school or at work? Um, and we always want to work at the client's pace and it's their journey. I always like to remember that it is their journey. Um, I might have some preconceived theories of how they should transition or what they should do, but that's really none of my business within their journey. Some considerations um, in regards to medication. Most psychiatric med medications do not interact with hormone replacement. Um, but we always want to double check. For example, spiralactone, which is a puberty blocker used with adolescents, um, can increase lithium bioavailability. So those patients who are on lithium and getting spiralactone might require less. So always double check for any interactions with hormones. Um, if you're doing CBT with patients, you know, you might want to focus or explore internalized transphobia, any negative self-talk, anticipated rejection. Um, we wanna make sure we do trauma-focused interventions for those who've experienced trauma. Um, some things to explore with exposure within the safety of therapy, uh, disclosing to friends, dating, using a public bathroom, public transit, work. I mean, there's a whole host of things that people can explore through their process of um, thinking and talking about transitioning. Uh, DPT skills due to distress intolerance due to their gender dysphoria, um, mindfulness, non-judgmental stance, 
practice in non-stressful situations, therapy, um, and then self-soothing techniques. Um, any referrals, know your limits and expertise. So if you're a mental health provider and you are just not comfortable or just don't feel you have the expertise, refer out. Therapy groups are great resources. Um, make sure any referrals out you make are transgender friendly. So there are LGBTQ AA, NA, CMA meetings. Um, local LGBTQ centers are great resources. And this is, you know, I think especially in the Bay Area, we're often very well-meaning and a lot of people like to wear a transgender flag or a rainbow flag on their badge, but that does not always mean proper training or experience. Um, so that, you know, means that they might be an ally on some level, but doesn't mean that they have proper training or experience. And then how to be a clinical ally. Start by exploring your own biases, your own counter-transference. What's your relationship to gender? What are your opinions? What's your experience with cis privilege or your own trans identity? And what are your thoughts about the concept of non-binary? Non-binary is often a, a difficult um, concept for some people to have because we live in such a binary culture. Acknowledge that the client is the expert of their transgender and non-binary experience and identity. Um, don't assume gender identity based on outward expression, especially in the clinical environment, just because they present as one gender to us does not mean that's how they identify or how they express themselves in the outer, outside world. Um, inform families about risk factors for transgender youth. Discuss the evidence like those past slides I showed. Um, and then speak out actively and openly against heterosexism, racism, homophobia, and transphobia. We have the ability to create hostile work environments or hostile clinical environments when um, you know comments, slurs, and violence go unchallenged. So I really encourage all of us to use, you know, our differing levels of privilege to speak out about these things. Okay, let's take. We have two minutes for questions. Um, the rest of these slides are resources. Um, there's some great resources on here. Um, again, there's binding, packing, tucking, and padding, which is a great resource to give to parent, uh, to patients. Um, I also want to point out the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. Um, facts for families. These are sheets that can be given to families. Um, the transgender and gender diverse Youth Fact for Families is a great one. Um, it talks a lot about the support for patients. All right, Dominic, take it away with questions. Uh, there was a question about uh, you assessing functionality such as using the MMPI. Um, are there, I guess, instruments that are used by you or others? <laughs> No, they, there are no currently no evidence-based assessment tools for um, or um, evidence-based treatment therapy processes for um, transgender youth or adults. There is um, seeking safety, which is a trauma-informed substance use um, manualized treatment. There's some research that have been done with trans women transgender women, um, but there's no specific that, that I'm aware of. Um, oh. Okay. Uh, well, this may be our last question. Can you speak a little bit more about gender euphoria and what it looks like? I have a client who has some, they have some worry about maybe hypomanic, but is not having any dysfunction. Can gender euphoria look like hypomania? No. No, gender euphoria is, doesn't, I, I mean, A, gender euphoria is not clinical. Um, there's, there's no diagnosis of gender euphoria. Everyone experiences feeling accepted. I mean, think about when we feel accepted and heard in a, an environment and how we feel. Um, that, that is gender euphoria. If they're experiencing symptoms of hypomania, um, I think definitely look more into that. It's much more likely um, 
let me just, I'm looking at your slide, um, a visual learner. Can you speak a bit more about gender euphoria? What well, it looks like I have a client who's somewhere in maybe hypomanic, but not having any dysfunction. Yeah, I would explore that more with them. Um, and, you know, it, it, and their gender euphoria would be much more around their gender identity and not in other areas of their life. So um, it would really depend upon the symptoms of their hypomania that I would explore more. Well, we are just over time. Thank you so much, Brian, for uh, this fabulous presentation. I put my email in the chat if you want to email me uh, and I can send out the uh, slideshow. To, uh, those Great. People. Thank you so much and feel free to email me with any questions. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.